Covent Garden. I live in Fullerton, just down the 91 freeway. Wrote a book, lead a ministry called Gospel Patrons. But uh, God wrote a better book called The Bible. So we're actually going to be in that book today. But when Darren asked me to speak, he said, hey, can you do two weeks in a row? And calendaring and scheduling didn't work out. So I said, I'm going to do two different services this morning, like he said. So if this sermon is terrible, you can either go home and wait for next week, or you can double down and give me the benefit of the doubt. Um, But that's up to you. So Darren asked me to speak about generosity. And I know most of you woke up this morning thinking, I hope they talk about money at church today. I just can't wait for them to talk about money. Please let us talk about money at church, right? No, you didn't. Okay, so at my small group for our church, we were talking this last week about what are we going to do for a Christmas party. I don't know if you guys are small you know, house church or small groups, you're doing Christmas party kind of things. And one of the ladies in our group said, um, are we going to do a Shabunda party? And I said, what? And her husband said, oh, she means a white elephant gift exchange. She's like, I always grew, grew up with it being called Shabunda. It's called Shabunda. I'm like, has anyone else ever heard of Shabunda? Her husband's just like rolling his eyes, shaking his head. She's like, it's really fun. It's when you exchange gifts, but then people get nasty and they steal them from you. And it's like really fun. And then there's a limit on how many times you can steal the gift. Are we going to do a Shabunda party? And I said, that sounds like a disease that you catch, right? Like I came down with Shabunda. Or you can say it when someone sneezes, like Shabunda, right? And you might, the people think you're speaking in tongues or something. But anyway, when you think of generosity, I, her husband actually looked up Shavanda on like Urban Dictionary, and it means a gift that you receive that you literally shove under the bed because <laughs> you don't want it, right? <laughs> I'm like, that is life changing. From now on, White Elephant Gift Exchange is called Shavanda in my book. That's not the kind of generosity we're going to talk about this morning, okay? We're not talking about that kind of generosity. But before you start thinking generosity, dollars and cents, percentages and budgets, I really want to put it in a much bigger context this morning. I want to put it in actually a massive context. We forget that Christianity is a message not just for us and not just about us. Christianity is fundamentally and primarily about God. That God is actually at work in the world. Despite the fires, despite the chaos, despite our politics, God is working out a plan in this world. Amen? He has a purpose. He is moving things toward a desired outcome, and we know the outcome from the end of the book. If you've read it, it's a great multitude that no one can number gathered around the throne of God from every tribe, language, people, and nation worshiping and praising this great God. No longer worried. No longer stressed, no longer in pain, no longer crying, no longer in broken relationships, but gloriously rejoicing in who God is and reflecting who he is. Christianity is fundamentally about this news. God is doing something in the world, something big, something exciting, something worth getting on board with in our lives. We forget that. God is up to to something writing a great story, and you and I are actors in the story. We have a part to play. We're not just extras. We're not just throwaway characters. God actually wants to involve human beings in his story. It's a miracle of grace. So I want to tell you again the story of God. It's the old, old story. I'll try not to add too much to it. I'm not going to get fancy for you this morning and do a little dance or something. But I want to give you the news again and put this understanding, our understanding of generosity in the story of what God is doing Our story begins at the very beginning in the book called Genesis. If you have a Bible, I'd love you to go there. I like the Bible a whole lot, so we're going to look at a variety of different passages. If you have a phone, download an app called YouVersion, and you'll get a Bible there for free. Any hundred different English translations or something like that. If you have a paper Bible or tablet, grab it. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. You flip in there. Doesn't matter so much what I say, it matters what God says. So take a look in his book, Genesis chapter 2, grab your phone, grab your Bible, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. This is the story of creation, the beginning of the world. It says, that, it says this in verse 7 Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. I love that picture of man being like this clay sculpture that God is, you know, making a sandcastle at the beach, and he makes it in the shape of a man, but it's not alive until he, and all of a sudden this 
being made of dust, wakes up with the living breath of God inside of him. And God calls him man. The breath of God is what makes us alive. Not that your heart is beating or you woke up this morning or you had a good breakfast or whatever. We live by the breath of God breathed within us. That's what makes us alive. The Lord God formed the man from the dust, from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground, the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden the tree of the no- and the tree of the knowledge of the good, good and evil. Imagine that, what verse 9 says. The Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Do you guys have jacaranda trees in Long Beach? You know what I'm talking about? Apple trees, oranges, pomegranates, grapefruits, peaches, plums, nectarines, all in the garden, all right there. They didn't have to make it. They didn't have to cultivate it. They didn't have to water it. They didn't have to wait for it to grow. God puts man, and if we keep reading, makes woman, a helper fit for him. They're to give names to all the livestock. He puts them in the most perfect paradise imaginable. Imagine, they didn't have to work. They didn't didn't really have to go to work. I mean, they did name animals, but as far as like the sweat of their brow and toiling and laboring to get money so that they could buy food to provide for themselves, God says, no, no, the food is actually already taken care of. It's already ripe. It's hanging on the tree. Just pick and eat as much as you want. You're good. They're in right relationship with God, perfect relationship with God. Later it says that God walks with them in the garden in the cool of the day. Imagine going for an evening stroll with God. Oh, I hear him. Eve, let's go. It's go. It's time. It's time. He's coming. Let's go. God is coming. We get that evening walk when the light is slanting and it's the golden hour of the day. And we just get to talk with God about our day and what we did and what we were thinking of naming the animals and the beautiful creation that he made and celebrating the sunset that he called forth again. They're in perfect relationship with one another. Adam is totally in love with Eve and she's loving him back. When God makes Eve, Adam's response is poetry. It's probably a song, it says in verse 23. Then when he sees, uh, the, man, the man sees that God has made a woman, it says in verse 23, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. In your Bible, if you're not looking at a device and you actually have a real Bible, um, they offset it. It's offset from the regular paragraph and flow. That's because it's poetry. Adam responds with just this overflowing love for his wife. So perfect relationship, husband and wife, perfect relationship with God, perfect relationship with creation. In order to name the animals, they have to be close enough to the animals and see the animals. Animals have to be walking up near them. They have to be able to recognize them, identify them, make distinctions between them. They have as much food as they want. I'm sure it's perfect climate. They're naked together. That's fun. (laughs) And they're all vegans eating fruit all day long. Which some of you is like, that's not paradise. But apparently in God's book, it was paradise back then. Perfect world. A generous God who had given them everything. Life, breath, each other, food, meaningful work, everything. And then he gives them one command. The command of God. Genesis chapter 2. Where is it, actually? Yeah. The Lord God took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. I think Adam, at this point, should go, are you serious? Every one? I mean, all those fruits, everything that I see, are you kidding me? This is like the perfect buffet. (laughs) All of it? For free? I don't have to, like, clock in, clock out, Lord, do anything for you. God's like, yeah, all of it is yours. Any tree that you want to eat from. And in that moment, I think he's saying like, wow, what an amazingly generous and kind and loving God. He would give me this? And then God gives him his one command. 
But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And if I'm imagining this story, I picture Adam going, yeah, fine. Yeah, no problem, right? There's just one tree I can't eat of, but every other tree that's pleasing to to the eyes and good for food is mine. Yeah, I can do without one. You're God, I'm not, I get it. You're the creator, I'm the creation. So yeah, whatever you say, no problem. And so Adam is happy, Eve is happy. They're living under the rulership, under the command of God in this perfect setting that he set them up for. Until the tragedy of the lie enters the world. It's insanity, really. Genesis chapter 3, if you still have a Bible, keep looking down at it. Here's the story. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? Now, pause. This is how all temptation will always start in your life. Did God actually say? Do we really need to believe the word of God or can't you just do what you want to do? This is how Satan always comes at us. Did God actually say? The first lie in the world is is undercutting the command and the word of God. Do you see this? This is not just about produce. It's not just about a piece of fruit. Did God actually say? Can we actually challenge the creator who made us? Did God actually say, Eve, that you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? He takes their abundance that they can have and he begins to push it into a scarcity mindset with with a twisting of... Wait, you can't eat of any tree? Is that what he said? Is that what he said, Eve? Eve engages in this diabolical conversation. And the woman said to the servant, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Right. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. True. Neither shall you touch it. Not true. God never said that. She begins twisting in this conversation with Satan, and pretty soon her understanding of the word of God is beginning to get twisted. She's adding things to it that God actually never said. God never said you can't touch it. But she sees she's engaging in temptation, and that's how it begins. It seems like a really religious conversation at first. Okay, so the way to worship God, right, is you can't eat from any tree. This is how you worship your God? Well, yes, no, we can eat from any tree, just not the one in the middle and touch it, and it begins to get twisted. Not all conversations need to be engaged in, actually. Not all books need to be read, not all blog posts, not all comments, not all feedback needs to be engaged in. Sometimes when it begins to get to this point, did God actually say, you're like, well, I'm going to defend the honor of God. You know what? Eve should have just walked away. She should have just walked away. Done. No, that's not a conversation for me. It's not going to lead me to a good place. It's not going to end in a healthy you know, place. I'm not, it's not about the worship of God. Here, here we're coming to analyze God. Wait, shouldn't we invite God into this conversation? Let's wait till the afternoon when he walks in the cool of the day. We'll ask him. She's engaging in a conversation and begins to twist the word of God. We may not eat the fruit of the trees in the garden or touch it, she says, lest you die. So the serpent takes this sort of religious conversation and then it's an outright lie, verse four of chapter three. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Okay, that's just blatantly attacking and opposing what God said. God said, in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. And the serpent says, you will not surely die. Now it's a case of who you're gonna believe. Who are you going to listen to? Who gets to be the authority? He goes on, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, with her protecting her, with her defending her. Nope. Just with her, saying nothing, being completely passive while she's being warped into this tragic conversation. She gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. 
pause. Do you see, the story of God starts in a garden with a tremendously generous father who creates us not because he has to, not because he needs anything. Out of his pleasure, he makes man from the ground. He's the creator. We're the creation. And the lie enters in to say, did God really say, maybe you can challenge the creator and win. Maybe you can go against God and not die. Maybe you can be like God. Maybe you can call the shots. Maybe the created beings can assert themselves and become the boss. Do you see this isn't just about fruit? Adam and Eve's disobedience against God was reversing the whole created order. The creation demands to be the creator. This is why the Bible says that all of creation is groaning, in Romans chapter 8, for this to be over that the created order was twisted here when man and woman demanded we must be God and have no limits, no boundaries, no distinctions, and no commands. We want to do what we want to do. And we think it's freedom. And the lie is that it's going to give us life. And it actually leads to death. Temptation always goes there. It, what's the saying? It takes you farther than you ever wanted to go and always leaves you disappointed. It doesn't satisfy. It looks good. The fruit looked good to Eve. It looks good. It undercuts the word of God. It puts you in the position of of authority. I feel good. I'm going to make a decision. Yeah, that's right. It's about time. And it leaves you in death. It leaves your life in destruction, and it leaves you totally unsatisfied. This is the tragedy and insanity that man would shun the generosity of God and try to live off of his own resources when God had already given him everything. Do you see this? This isn't just a little thing. Sin is not just a little thing. It's insanity. It's insanity that we as dust who God breathed into would try to live as God. It's slavery. It's shackles. Man in sin upended the whole creation order. We revolted, we rebelled, we rejected the God who so lovingly made us and gave us life, breath, and everything. And in the end, we find Adam and Eve knew good and evil, but they also knew death and separation from God. And this is where the world is today. In this big story of God that I'm painting for you this morning, this is where the world still finds itself today. Lost in sin, desiring to be God, desiring to be in charge, desiring to, in what's in the name of freedom, actually enter into slavery. Chasing things that look good, chasing things that might feel good, chasing things that might sound good, but in the end, feeling bankrupt and broken and empty inside. Walk around Long Beach. Walk around the city I live in. This is where people live. This is the world we live in. Lost, depressed, broken, lonely, hurting, weak, and suffering. And still chasing things we think will satisfy. Oh, what we need most is to be reconciled to the generous God who loved us, made us, and is willing to enter into our lives. And one of the greatest indicators of looking at this heartbeat, this lostness in our world, I'm convinced, is how we view and handle money. This is a key indicator for our relationship with God. We don't often talk about this in church. It doesn't often come up. It's been talked about so badly in so many ways, in so many different places. So I hope not to repeat that this morning. But I want you to know that Jesus talked more about money than anything else. 25% of his parables had to do with money, possessions, and stewardship. If you came to this church and I was the pastor and I preached on money once a month, would you stay? (laughs) Would you? Let's be honest. That's what we find in the Gospels with Jesus Christ. He was constantly talking about money, possessions, and stewardship. Why? Because he wanted to get rich? No. He didn't have a place to lay his head. Jesus wasn't seeking wealth and fame. But he said this, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Your money and your heart are tied together. Anyone ever, any basketball fans in here ever do March Madness? 
right? You, there's like an office pool going on, or you're in college, and you're like, oh, what the heck, I'll just throw 20 bucks in, fill up the bracket, see if my team wins. Even if you don't really care about college basketball, some of you guys are like, yeah, I just did it because everyone in my office was filling out a bracket. As soon as you put 20 bucks in, you care, <laughs> right? <laughs> you're like, I, I put 20 in, that's it. I could have spent that on lunch, but it's in, and I have the potential to win 200. Like, I, uh, go, come on, University of Kentucky, you gotta win. <laughs> Even if you don't care about basketball. Where your money is, your heart will be also. Jesus knew that our, our view of money and our view of generosity and how we handle stuff and possessions is actually spiritual. It's not just material, it's not just a transaction that it's actually fundamentally expressing something about our relationship with God. That's why Jesus says you cannot serve God and money. You can serve God and you can serve money, but you can't serve them both. He actually says you must decide. You must make a decision. Which one are you going to serve? Because it's impossible to do both because both want your whole heart. Both want total dependence over your life. And you cannot... You, you can try, but you will fail. First Timothy says that those who desire to be rich pierce themselves with many pangs. Those who really want to chase the love of money end up in ruin and destruction. That's what the Bible says. The love of money is a, the root of all kinds of evils. So we cannot love God in money. And if we look at the world, what does our world love more than anything? Money. And sex is number two. We want both all the time with no limits. That's why you can go to any bookstore and find books over and over about how to find financial freedom and financial independence and passive income and retire at 40 and be a millionaire this and stay at home and work six hours a week and you're going to make 400 grand. And like, there's all this crap out there in the world, right? You know this. You see this too. I'm not the only one. Our world is desperately chasing money. Because we know that it has some value. It's not that money has no value, and I'm not saying money is bad. But it expresses something about our hearts, what we do with it. And that really matters to God. Our hearts really, really, really matter to God. What we do with our treasure expresses our view of God. Let me ask you a few questions. Just inventory your own life right now. Would the way that you use your money, your treasure your possessions, whether they're great or small, would, they, would, would others be able to say that it looks like you're living for God's kingdom or for your own kingdom? Would others say it looks like you're living for the glory of God or your own glory and exaltation? Would the way you use and steward the money that you have, whether great or small, show that you have God's values deep within you or are they expressing your values? Are you storing up treasure in heaven or on earth? Are you worried or are you content? These are questions that the Bible poses to us to say the, your life has a dashboard like your car and there's lights that go off that are key indicators about the health of your, your life and your walk with God. And if there, your life is like a dashboard, one of the biggest, brightest lights on that dashboard is what you do with money. It's not irrelevant to your Christian faith. It actually is an expression of your Christian faith or not. You tracking with me so far? So what you do with your wealth is critical, which is why Jesus publicly praises in Luke 21. You probably know this story. Publicly praises a widow who walks up to the offering box, puts in her last two copper coins, turns to walk away, and she's probably this, I picture her as this little alone widow who nobody would notice, just totally obscure, one of those invisible people, and she's just kind of going to walk away, and Jesus publicly praises her for her generosity and says, this woman has put in more than all those who have come before her because she put in all that she had to live on. Jesus praises one person in the Gospels for their generosity, and it's a widow who put two copper coins into the offering box. Now, none of us, if that widow was our mother, would say to, you know, Mom, I know times are tight, Dad died, things are tough. Um, I know you just got two bucks left. Give it to church, Mom. You know, I've been talking to our financial advisors and financial planners, and we've all sort of agreed, Mom, that the best thing with your last two bucks is to put it into the offering. 
Nobody would advise their mom that way. Do you see? This is where our culture has got the totally backwards from what Jesus actually believed, taught, and thought. Because Jesus sees this woman who goes against all the worldly principles that you and I know, and he says she's incredible. She's given more than anyone. More in dollars? No. No. God's not measuring the size of your gift. But what God knows is that this woman, this woman had a huge view of him. A huge view of God. And her gift was expressing that. Track with me. If you throw your last two copper coins in, what her, what her offering was declaring, both privately in her own heart and publicly to Jesus who saw her, was, I trust God. I don't know where the next money is going to come from. I don't know where I'm going to get food for lunch today. I don't know the future, but what I do know is God. What I can bank on is God. What I live for when I have nothing else to lean upon is God. He is everything to me, even to the point where I'll give all that I have to live on. God is great. God is trustworthy. He's better than life. Do you see that? This is what this woman is saying with two copper coins. What you do with your wealth is totally an expression of your faith in God or not, or the degree to which you're somewhere in the middle. Money, money really matters to God. Not because he needs yours, he doesn't. The Bible says that all the cattle on a thousand hills are his. Guess what? And the hills. All the silver and gold are his. All of it. God is supremely rich. He doesn't need your offering, whatever it's going to be, but he loves to use it and he loves to see that when you give it, it's an expression of your view of him. So often, talking about money from the Bible, in churches, or wherever it's talked on TV, is twisted. It's mixed up. It's saying God wants your money. God doesn't want your money. He doesn't need it. He loves to involve you in the family business. He loves to involve you in his plans. He loves it when your heart expresses his values. He loves it when you take a step of faith to trust him. He loves that. But he doesn't need it. It's a free invitation. This woman, the poor widow, had a huge view of God. And I'm, I'm tragically afraid that our culture and most of us are not like the, the widow. We're more like the rich fool. You know that story, too, from the Gospels, where Jesus comes to this man who's had a really great year with crops, and so he's like, well, man, this is just a banner year, bumper crop. I'm gonna, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to build a huge barn because, well, the barn that I have is it's obviously not big enough, right? I've had that good of a year, so I'm going to get an extra account, and I'm going to get a manager for that account, and I'm going to build this barn, and we're going to put everything in it because I'm going to retire early. Guys, I made it. I did. I'm out of the game, out of the rat race. I'm done. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Life is good. God is good. He blessed me. God is so good. I mean, he caused the rain, and the crops are coming in. And, like, God is amazing, guys. Look at this barn that I have. Isn't this awesome? Like, God praise God from, right? <laughs> and you know how the story goes? Jesus comes to this man in the parable and says, you fool, tonight your life will be required of you. Why are you storing up what didn't belong to you? I blessed you to be a blessing. I blessed you to give. I blessed you to pour it out for those in need. I blessed you to take it and spread the great news of God around the world. And what did you do? All you wanted was to eat, drink, and be merry. You fool, tonight your life will be required of you. Which one is the American church more like? Come on, come on. Can I be honest here? This is who we are as a culture. We love and chase money. We are totally lost and locked in the same lie that Adam and Eve believed. If I could just depend on myself, I don't need God. I don't need anyone. I have a job. <laughs> I, have, I, I got a good passing score on the SATs. I got a Christmas bonus coming to me. I don't need anything. See, the American church and the Amer Americans in general, we all kind of secretly have this goal. We don't tell anyone, we don't really talk about it, but the goal is to not need anyone, including God. We have this quiet, silent goal. I don't want to need God or anyone, not my family, nobody to depend on, not even my company. I'll be independently wealthy. I'll have so much passive income, you won't even believe it. <laughs> right? That's what we think, and we think that's life. It's actually death. 
It's death. If God blesses you, it's not for you. It's to be a blessing. And we twist it. We want to be like Adam and Eve. We want to be, crea- we want to be creations of God who act like creators. I don't rely on him. I don't even need him. I got the whole plan worked out. And our world is lost in sin. It's lost in sin. It looks like, it looks like financial wisdom so often. But it's greed. It's independence, it's, it's selfishness, and it's saying to God, no thanks. I want you to feel the weight of this. This is the fundamental lie of our culture. Jesus didn't say you can't love God and have a relationship. He didn't say you can't love God and sex. He didn't say you can't love God and... He said you cannot love and serve God and money. He didn't say in the Bible that the root of all evils is lust. He didn't say the root of all evils is lies. He actually said the root of all kinds of evils is the love of money. Guys, I think that the love of money is the largest religion in the world because people from every religion love money. Muslims love money. Hindus love money. Buddhists love money. Christians love money. Everybody in the cults loves money. All kinds of new age, weird spiritualists love money. Christian scientists love money. Atheists love money. Everybody loves money, right? Are you tracking with me? People love money because we're using it as a substitute for God. If I can rely on it, I don't have to rely on him. But we forget. We were breathed into by God. We are made to depend on him. And it's the last thing we want to do. This is sin. This is sin. And sin leads to death. Most of us, if we looked at the dashboard of our lives and we evaluated our money, live our financial lives completely separate from God. You never pray about your money. You worry about it a whole bunch or the lack of money or your debt. You worry about it a ton. But you don't pray. You don't invite God in to walk with you in it. You don't share it with others. You don't ask for prayer requests about it. You don't rally your house church around your need. You don't, you don't actually, you're not actually content with what you have. You're always looking for the next paycheck, the next bump, the next raise, the next promotion, the next, I wish I could be that guy. I wish I had what he has. I wish I had what she has. I wish I had her Instagram account instead of mine, right? If we looked at the financial dashboard of our lives, we're relying on our own wisdom and we're hustling like orphans rather than children of a great father. Come on, guys. Let's be honest here. This is sin. We've lived our financial lives as if God's not in it. We may be saved, but the love of money is choking out fruitfulness in our lives. Jesus said it was going to happen. The seed may have been planted, but you're not bearing 30, 60, and 100 fold fruit. Why? Because the desires of the world and the desire to be wealth, wealthy have come in and choked out the seed and it bears no fruit. I don't want that for you. I don't want that for your church. I don't want that for our nation. That we would be a generation who comes and passes through. We live, we get good jobs, we have children, we raise families, we retire early, we give our kids a little inheritance, we travel with our wives, kick off the bucket list, die bearing no eternal lasting fruit for God's kingdom. Is that what you want? Nobody wants that. But we're blind to that actually happening because we are blind to our love of money. The love of money and the desire for the world and what it offers and all the things that dangle in front of you are choking out your spiritual fruitfulness. God has made you to be soldiers. He's made you to be warriors. He's made you to engage in the fight. He's made you to be sons and daughters of the king who live like it. And you're settling, church. We are settling for fancy, shiny, nicer, bigger, beautiful, more numbers in the account. We're totally settling. And I want to call you back to what God has for your life. He has great things for your life. But there's a problem not just for us. There's in this sin, there's a problem for God. There's a massive problem for God in the sin of mankind. Why? Because God is holy. 
which means he never sins, which means he doesn't tolerate sin, which means he doesn't welcome sin into his presence. And that's what we are, apart from Christ. That's what we bring to the table. We don't bring, hey God, like, look at all the good things that I did. When we come to Jesus for the first time, what we bring is pockets that are empty. <laughs> we got nothing but sin. And God, in his perfect holiness and justice, demands that sin be punished. And we know from scripture that the punishment for sin is death. So for God to be who he is, perfect in justice, not overlooking evil and abuse and rebellion, not just sweeping it away, he must punish sin. But we also know from scripture that God is love. He totally is passionate about Adam and Eve. He's passionate about you. He loves you. He loves me. He doesn't just see us as a mass or as a crowd. He sees your life as an individual. He knows your name. He knows the number of hairs on your head, the number of days, hours, and seconds that you will live. He loves you. So what is God to do? In the midst of our sin, a rejecting of creator, trying to be our own gods, ruling our own worlds by our wealth. God is in this quandary, you could say, between his love and his justice. But Christmas hits a high note. At Christmas in the story of God, we hit a total high note because we see that God does something nobody expected. In Matthew chapter one, we read this. Here's the prophecy fulfilled. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The story of Christmas is the story of God entering into human flesh, the second person of the Trinity taking on flesh and bones as we have. Think of it, the creator entered into creation, the author entered in and became a character in his own story. Who would have imagined that? Who could have ever thought that up? The angels didn't know it. The prophets didn't really know it. Even Jesus' disciples have been with him three years. It was like, come on. God would become a man? Enter into his own story? God did what no one expected. What we could not do for ourselves by setting ourselves free from sin, God did for us. He said, you can't accomplish it. All the religions of the world are trying to reach up to God through some form of offering, some form of sacrifice, some form of service. If only in the midst of my sinful condition I could just reach up to God and maybe do more good than bad, then maybe, maybe he would accept me. Maybe he would love me. This is the gospel of Muslims. I was just in the Middle East last month, or a couple weeks ago actually, and I talked to so many Muslims. And one of the questions I love to ask is, if you died tonight, are you for sure that you'd go to heaven? All of them said no. Of course not. We can't know that. Why can't you know that? Because I don't know if I'm good enough. Right? I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I've done enough. I don't know if God's going to be pleased with my life enough. That's not Christianity. Praise God. That's not Christianity. We have a better story. Our story is that God knew we couldn't reach up to him, could never overcome our sin and rebellion by our own efforts. So he did what we cannot do. What we couldn't earn, he gave. And he gave it freely by entering into our world in the person of Jesus. And that God would, God would give what is most precious to him, his son, his only son, and God gave his son not no, knowing what it would be for his son. Not that his son was going to be born in a palace. Not that he was going to be a trust fund baby. Not that he was never going to have any problems or struggles. God chose for his son to be born poor. And he chose for his son to go to the cross. And he chose for his son to be humiliated before the watching world. I'm here with my son this morning. I cannot imagine giving this kid up for anything except the plans and purposes of God. How much would I have to love someone to leave here and get home? And my wife says, hey, where's Malachi? I was like, oh, uh, I met someone in need, and they needed a kid, and I really loved them, so I left him. 
my wife would shoot me, right? <laughs> she would shoot me. Why? Because we totally love our son. Love you, son. <laughs> I do. How much would you have to love something to give up your son or your daughter, for those of you who have girls? That's the most costly thing you could give. And then to give that most costly thing to die an excruciatingly painful death on a Roman cross. How much would you have to love someone? I can't imagine it. Oh, the riches and depth of God's wisdom. Oh, his unsearchable love. Oh, the boundless knowledge and patience and grace and riches and mercy that he has. That he who was over us as the creator, who breathed into us, would enter in, give us his son to become flesh and bones that we celebrate at Christmas, die on a cross in our place for our sin, that we, rebels, might be reconciled to the Father and become children of God. Guys, this is what Christmas is all about. I know you hate like I do that it's like all commercial, it's all about the gifts, and maybe this year we're not going to do as many gifts. You said that last year and you still did gifts, so you're probably going to do it again this year. But it's about the gift that God gave. Christmas is about God's generosity. We didn't ask for Jesus. We didn't ask him, please, God, we're in a quandary down here. We got ourselves in a mess. Could you uh, maybe send your son and have him come and save us? We didn't ask for that. God did what we could not do and what we never asked for. See, the, the, the beauty of Christmas, the beauty of the gospel is this, that we think God could win just by speaking forgiveness, right? The world has such a cheap view of grace. Well, God, he said, let there be light, and there was light. So can't, when I sin, can't he just say, let there be forgiveness, and there's forgiveness? Can't he just speak it, and it's done? No, because he's totally just. That wouldn't be just. That's not my God. It wouldn't be holy, but he's also loving, and so God didn't triumph through an act of just spoken words. He didn't triumph through, a, triumph through an act of power, right? I'm going to come and just kill Satan and just kill demons and just kill Adam and Eve. And I'm the right king and everyone knows it. No, God triumphed through generosity. He gave. He won by giving. Nobody saw that coming. That God was going to give of himself to the point of his son dying on a cross and win. And actually win the story. Win us back to a re reconciled relationship with the one God who made us and loved us. Win our hearts back from loving stuff and ourselves and money. And instead turning outward to say, that's not what I value. I love you and want to serve you and your kingdom. And all of my money, wealth, possessions is at your disposal, king. It's not mine. It's temporary. It's yours. And he would win the perfect place where his love and justice met in the death of his own son on the cross. Christians, this is what we believe. This is the message of the Bible. The whole thing is the story of God's tremendous love and generosity. How we rejected it and he, in our rejection of his generosity, keeps giving. He keeps giving. Would you give to your enemies? That's what he calls us to because that's what he did. When God loves, he gives. And when we are called to be like him, when we love, we give. John 3, 16, the most famous verse in the Bible says this. For God so loved the world that he gave, period. Okay, not period, but that's what I'm trying to point, emphasize. God loved and he gave. When God wanted to express his tremendous love for the world, when he wants to accomplish this saving purposes, he gave. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, in Jesus, shall not perish, though we deserve it, but have everlasting life. This whole generosity conversation is twisted when we think it's just about us and our money. This is about God and his glory. This is about God and his character. God is the greatest giver. The Apostle Paul in the book of Ephesians is just like grasping for language to try to describe this salvation message. And here are some terms he comes up with, Ephesians 1.7. In him, we have redemption. Through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 2.4. But God being rich in mercy. Ephesians 2.7. God's immeasurable riches of his grace. 
He uses the language of riches over and over in Ephesians because he's like, I can't tell you how to describe this, but God is richer and more generous than you've ever dreamed. Not just rich in money, not just rich in provision, rich in what you need most, mercy. Rich in what I need most, grace. He's rich in it. It's deep. You have no idea how many accounts he has of grace and riches because it just keeps overflowing. This is who God is. The essence of the gospel is God's generosity. Ephesians 2.8 says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. When he wants to describe what God has done for us in Jesus Christ on the cross, he just says, I don't know what to say. It's riches. It's gift. (laughs) It's generosity. That's what it is. The gospel is generosity. Romans 10, 12. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. Message of the gospel is that we've rejected the generosity of God and he keeps bestowing his riches on us, mostly through his son, Jesus Christ, who entered our world lived in our mess, never sinned, died in our place, took our rebellion upon himself and kept giving to us life, breath, forgiveness, redemption, provision. We're not orphans. If you follow Jesus Christ, if you have welcomed him into your life as your savior, you're not an orphan. You're a son or a daughter of God. And my son doesn't wake up in the morning and say, Dad, how much money do you have in the bank? And he doesn't wake up in the morning and say, Dad, uh, uh, where is breakfast going to come from? He wakes up in the morning trusting that he has a good father who's going to provide for him. And he had to learn that over time. Through consistency and through character, he has learned my character is to provide for him. I don't give him everything he wants that's not a blank check with me. I'm not that kind of parent. But he knows if he needs it, He'll have it because I love him. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference between our worldly mindset and the character and nature of our God and this gospel that we believe? I want you to know that God is on a mission in this world to vindicate his name. Where we threw mud and black paint on God's name and just said, done with you. You're not that generous. You're not that good. I'd rather be in charge. God is on a mission to vindicate his name for all to see. To show again to everyone in heaven, all angels, all demons, everyone who's ever lived, I am great. I'm generous. I'm loving. I'm just. I'm holy beyond what you could imagine. And this is the stage. Think Olympics. This earth is God's stadium and we are the runners on the track. Are you going to sit down and play with your phone and stress about your bank account? Or are you going to get up and run? This is our opportunity to say, God has set me free. He set me free from worries, fear, anxiety, chasing money, desiring to be rich, putting money as the number one goal in my life. God has set me free. He's the creator. I'm a creation. He's the father. Now by grace, I'm the son. I want to live for the father's glory with everything that I have to say he's worthy overall. This is the opportunity you have with your life and with your money to express the great news of who God actually is. Can you imagine a generous God like this not having generous children? (laughs) He is, if you're a Christian, he's shaping you into his image. And what you do with your wealth is part of your discipleship. It is discipleship. It's not ancillary to your faith. It's not a side business, and this this is about the real thing here this morning. What you think about on Monday, when the bill comes on Tuesday, When you stress on Wednesday, God's there. He wants to meet you. And he wants to shape in you the kind of character that reflects you're a person who knows who he is. You're a person who values what he values, and you're a person who lives for what he wants you to live for. God is doing this work in you. He's doing this work in you. I'd love to pray that God continues to do that so that the garden becomes a lighthouse in Long Beach and to the ends of the earth. That people in this city go, those people use wealth differently. People in this neighborhood go, they use money differently. 
People in this place, they go, they don't stress like we stress. They're not focused on what we're focused on. They're not chasing what we're chasing. They they have some stuff and they have fun and they use it for their family and they bless people, but they use it differently. What must they believe about God to use their money like that? That's the issue. Hey, when we come back next service at 11.15, like I said, totally different different, uh, sermon. But I've been trying to walk this out with a few guys from your church. We spent seven weeks together really practically saying, how do we grow in generosity? How do we actually grow? Because what I know is that I can't preach one sermon and you'll live generous forever. It just won't happen. But my heart is that you develop a heartbeat of generosity. Heart doesn't stop. It just keeps beating. It's not dependent on, oh, we got a budget shortfall. It's not dependent on, I got a letter in the mail. It's not dependent on, like, oh, you know, I saw a picture of a kid with a cleft palate or, like, you know, somebody's really sad somewhere else. Okay, then I should react and give. I want you to become the kind of church that has a heartbeat of, of generosity every week, every day. It's who you are because it's who God is. It's how you love because it's how God loves. It just keeps going. It doesn't stop. This isn't just a series. It's not just a one-time thing. It's not, you know, how do you get there? That's what a couple guys in your church and I have been trying to figure out. We'll talk about that next time.